The fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic provided a dress rehearsal for confronting the catastrophic risk of climate change. But unlike the disease, there is no vaccine to solve climate change. Alice Hill is former special assistant to President Obama and senior director for, the, for resilience on the National Security Council staff. She's currently a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Her new book is The Fight for Climate After COVID-19. Alice, welcome. Thank you, so glad to be able to join you. So what have we learned from the pandemic that can be applied to dealing with climate change? Simply put, preparation matters. The more we think about and plan for and imagine future catastrophic risk, the better off we'll be when that risk materializes. You know, you write that mitigation alone will no longer keep us safe. Is it too late to reverse the damage? I mean, is, is it admitting defeat? Well, of course, uh, we have a world that is heating up because of human activity unequivocally 99 percent of scientists say that we're warming because of emissions or carbon pollution from human activity and as that accumulates uh, we are warming at a more rapid rate your question goes to whether we can stop that we can't stop it all together but we can have a much better outcome if we cut our emissions. That means that we change to clean energy and make different choices going forward. But we'll also need to adapt because those emissions, the pollution forms like a blanket around the globe. And remember when you were a little kid, you went to sleep and your mom put a blanket on your bed at night and all of a sudden you started to heat up. Well, the same thing's happening with our planet. We need to address all those emissions, but we're also going to have some delayed heating just from the pollution emissions that we already have in the atmosphere. So you say not just mitigation, but adaptation. What does that mean? Well, adaptation means essentially preparing for the types of disasters that accompany rising temperatures and that's drought, deeper droughts than we've experienced, wildfires, bigger wildfires than we've ever experienced. You know, Californians learned last year a new word, gigafire, for a fire that burns more than a million acres at once. We're seeing extreme rainfall or what ex emergency managers call rain bombs. So much rain falls at once as it did with Ida that our subway stations are flooded because we haven't prepared those subway stations for this kind of rain. So we need to think ahead and make better choices about building and land use going forward. So not to make an understatement, but this is a huge problem to tackle. What's, what's the role of the federal government? What should government leaders look at doing right now? Well, the federal government has a very important role to support state, local, tribal leaders as they make decisions about how to prepare for climate impacts. And the reason why the federal government needs to support is because all of these impacts, even though climate change is a global problem, the pollution is caused by people all over the world, the impacts, these disastrous events, occur very locally. And so the federal government can play a role in providing the very best science so that local leaders can understand their risks. It can provide programs that help local leaders deal with the houses that are already in the floodplain, the schools that already are subject to being burned in wildfires, help them deal with that, but also provide incentives to get state and local leaders to help people move away from risk instead of toward risk. You know, right now, more people are moving into areas at risk of flooding and at risk of wildfire than into other areas. And we need to reverse that trend. What about the private sector, Alice? What role do they play in supporting the government in planning and strategy and, and technology? 
Well, the private sector, of course, is a very important here. It, it can help finance, most notably, to help make some of these investments. But it can also look at itself to make sure that it is prepared. These companies are prepared for climate risk. Unfortunately, our surveys show that on most boards of Fortune 100 companies, there's very little representation of people with knowledge about climate change. And that means that companies may not appreciate what's ahead. There was a study done by New York Stern Business School uh, reviewing 1188 resumes of directors on Fortune 100 companies. And out of those resumes, it determined only five, not 5%, five people had any background in environment or climate change. So we need to have everyone start thinking about, well, what does it mean if it's gonna get hotter here, we're gonna have extreme heat events, or we're gonna have more flooding or wildfires, or we're going to see dramatic long lasting drought. What does that mean for business operations? What does it mean for the community where my people live and work? Can they even get to work if it's flooding? during a sunny day, as we're seeing on the eastern seaboard, but just because of sea level rise, all those decisions need to be looked at to have better decisions going forward that keep people safe and keep companies' bottom lines healthier. Alice, your book says that federal leaders should be preparing for concurrent, consecutive, and compounding disasters. Is that what we're looking at? Multiple disasters coming one after the other? Yes. That's what the pandemic has shown us. You know, I don't think that FEMA ever imagined that they would have to respond to a disaster in all 50 states and six territories. But that's exactly what happened with the pandemic. And then you layer on, just look at 2020, what occurred in terms of natural disasters. We had so many named storms in the Atlantic basin that we had to change to the Greek alphabet. We ran out of name uh, and letters. We had wildfires that were devastating to the American West. We've seen that that wildfire smoke travels across the entire United States. And we saw heat extremes. And then this year we saw even greater heat extremes. So these disasters fall in multiple locations at once. And as they compound, because you have to evacuate people from a flood zone into shelters, but those shelters are already at risk of spreading COVID, we need to step back and rethink, how do we deliver emergency services when we face a world with a far greater risk of multiple disasters occurring at once? So you recommend actually preparing before disaster strikes. Absolutely. That is the most important thing any of us can learn is that if we spend money today to prepare and for and reduce risk, we will save so much money at the end. But more importantly, families, communities will get back on their feet much more quickly because their school isn't destroyed because they still have a home that's intact. And that means the economy hums, and that means that all of us can have thrive in a world with far more disasters. The basic figure is that for every dollar we spend on reducing risk, we save about $6 in future damages. So that's pretty attractive to make those investments today. Alice, I want to ask you about climate migrants, particularly from Central America. What have we seen in the past and what are we likely to see in the future? You know, when I was in the federal government at DHS, I uh, encountered the first wave of children from Central America, the Northern Triangle, that's uh, Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. We saw a surge of kids coming north. and. As we look at that, and that, of course, is now continuing, we're seeing ever more migrants. I call them survival migrants, a term that Alexander Betts, an author, coined. But these are people looking for a way to survive in the face of growing risks. One of the risks in Central America is climate change. 
They've had devastating drought. They've had a coffee rust that's a fungus that spreads and it spreads during storms. They've had uh, two back-to-back -back hurricanes. And when these poor countries are hit, they lose their livelihoods, they lose their, lose their homes, and they're already nations facing corruption, gang violence, and people decide, I'm going to go in search of a better life. So for the United States, one of the most important things we can do is help those nations thrive in the face of rising temperatures and the disasters that come with a hotter world. Well, in your book, you say that we need to jumpstart resilience. What does that mean? What policies need to be put in place for that? We need to make sure at the end of the day, for all of our decision making, we have considered climate risk. And that would jumpstart us in being able to build resilience to climate change. So one example is to make sure that we screen all of our investments, all of our federal investments, to make sure that they're resilient, to make sure that they will withstand the future. And that would be, for example, not pouring money into areas that are at great risk of flooding. So the, U, the U.S. needs to examine, should we be supporting development in the floodplain if we know that those homes and businesses and schools will be damaged? A similar thing should be, is this program going to be strong in the face of climate change? Take international development. We're going to invest in a malaria program. Well, we know that with, with malaria and with climate change, mosquitoes carry the malaria, their whole geographic spread will change. And we need to examine that as we make those choices. Essentially, every decision maker in the federal government needs to be aware of and consider climate risk and whether that will affect the decision which we're making today. And in most instances, it will, because climate change affects virtually everything. All right, well, Alice, thanks so much. Congratulations on the book. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you, what a pleasure.